this is going to be really important. Do you all see me? Do you see how good these glasses look on me? <laughs> Do you know how hard it is to find really good sunglasses? OK. <laughs> <laughs> For the condensed awesome types. So I'm going to tell you a story. And I'm actually going to tell you a couple of them. And then we're going to bring them all together. Cool? So I'm on a flight. Uh, I'm late. And I'm very territorial about carry-on space. And you're, when you're late, you know. It's a gamble. So I get there, and I, I'm getting really spoiled. I'm flying first class this time, and I'm an anti-capitalist, but I'm the anti-capitalist where everyone should be flying first class. <laughs> That's how they get you. You switch up real fast. <laughs> so the space in the overhead is full. I look over across from me. It's empty. The guy who's sitting there, he's got no, no baggage on his lap or something like that. So I take my luggage, my carry-on, European size, really neat. I go to swing it up there. And in a way that absolutely belied his age, he stood up, this man, and he put his hand in front of my face. And he said, do you belong here? <laughs> yes, he was. <clears throat> Yes, he was. Now, my first thought was, I can take this guy. <laughs> He's a little small. And there was something that happened in that exchange. Because, of course, this isn't the first time something like this has happened. In fact, if you are a person who travels everywhere, no matter how far you go, somebody always believes you exist on the margin, no matter how much you speak to the heart of things. Now, this particular man, I looked at him in all my years, because there is no handbook that tells you exactly what to say in this situation, right? What part of the decades of research or the hundreds of years that have passed, what part should I start at to educate this man, right? That's, that's my call to action, right? I'm supposed to educate everyone that I come across. But time has taught me that silence can do a lot, too, in those moments. So I looked at him. And he looked at me. And in that moment, something happened. And his eyes softened. In that moment, some kind of exchange took place. And then immediately, he started to backtrack. And he said, no, uh, no, no, no. You don't, you don't understand. I just thought. And I let him talk. And you know, I just stepped around him and put my luggage up there. But I've thought about that moment ever since. And I wonder if he has too. You see, something happened in that. Not a single one of us got to choose what body we'd be born into, what zip code we lived in, how our hair would grow out of our head, what skin color. Some of us got really lucky in that lottery. <laughs> Some of us are too cute for two genders. But not a single one of us got to choose that. We're born into a script. Now, everyone is very protective of their story. And everyone has a story. And that's the reason why people lose it when you talk about privilege, because they think that you're attacking their story. And we cling to that, don't we? So we hear privilege, we think, oh, that's, that's, that's my story of self. And anyone would get offended with that. But here's the thing. Privilege isn't about what you've gone through. It's about what you haven't had to go through. And so I'm not, we're not talking about stories. And we're talking about scripts. And every single person in this room and everyone out there, we were born into a script. And some of those scripts have contradictions. We have solid nuclear families, but maybe it wasn't such a great upbringing, despite what was in bank accounts. Or maybe you transitioned and you lost that. We're all born into a script. Some of us defy that. And that's precisely why so many black people and trans people and marginalized folks, Muslims, everybody, why we're so attacked. Because if we were to accept the script that we were born to, especially in this country, it would be to accept our own destruction. But you all know about defiance. That's what this industry is all about, right? 
rewriting things, changing things. So let's talk about that script for a second. This man, if I had asked him why he stood up, why he felt compelled in that moment to stop me, I doubt he'd be able to answer it. It was so, so built in that his understanding of belonging wasn't based on who he was, but who he was not. And I've thought about that because you see, if we're talking about what the work of activism really is, it's about seeing the world as it is, not as we're told. I'll get back into that in a moment. See, in that moment, what he didn't understand was he had forfeited a part of who he was. And that's what happens when we completely embody the script. We forfeit a part of who we are to fit into an entity and a system not a single one of us had a hand in creating. But it's funny how quickly those conditions become our own when we get comfortable. And I'm here to remind you that complacency is the death of the soul. You see, in that moment, he was so wedded to this idea of me and forfeiting a part of his agency that he became a defender. He became a guard, guarding this idea of me while I live my life. He's not growing as a person. I'll tell you another story, and then we'll get into the good stuff. I do a lot of this talking thing. Yes, I'm very good at it. <laughs> but I'm not always welcomed where I go. And I remember this one gig. I get up there, and on my way, there's lynch ropes hanging on trees. I was talking at Duke University. And the threats were considered so real that I needed security, but it was going to be awkward if it was off-duty cops, for them. I'm very friendly. So some emergency calls were made. And a friend of mine ended up you know, hooking me up with the Nation of Islam, which is a very traditionally homophobic entity, as much as they are for black liberation, or a kind of black liberation, I should say. And I, my gender identity was very much Battlestar Galactica at that time. <laughs> like, very, it was very intense. And before I knew it, before the you know, Black Panther sort of changed the world and everyone was talking about Wakanda, I was surrounded by eight beautiful men in bow ties and black suits. And everybody just thought that I was some kind of African royalty. And I was like, absolutely, yes, <laughs> I am. And we went through this entire day. And then one of them started to flirt with me, the biggest one. And he was like, uh, don't worry, sister. I'd take the bullet for you. And I was like. <laughs> Is that what straight flirting is right now? <laughs> and then, I mean, he never left my side, and he came out with a rose. And I thought, are they teaching magicians in the nation? <laughs> but at the end of that, we had an exchange. You see, they didn't know what my pronoun was, or they didn't understand uh, what my gender identity was. And they really only knew how to interact with me in a particular way. But we got through that night because we had an agreement, a 25% agreement. They believed that my life was worth protecting. And I believed that their life was worth protecting. And for that night, that was enough. I think we've got to stop getting this idea in our head that we have to trust each other 100%. So what is the work of activism? Activism is, at the heart of it, being for someone else who you needed most in your most vulnerable moments. And here's the thing about activism. It doesn't build character. It reveals character. And isn't it about time you figured out exactly who you were? Isn't that why we're here? Isn't that why trans people are so threatening? So we have the audacity to be clear about what it is that we are, despite being born into a rigid, dated, and boring script. No one's ever offended by pronouns. They're offended by the implications, the audacity. Here's the thing. There's an endless array of buzzwords now. And we're all really good at performing it. 
we use the hashtags and we wear the t-shirts. We can put free on a turtleneck. You can do all kinds of things. We're really, really good at that. Something about a black square once. And it can be very difficult in this time of infinite content and finite attention to know exactly where you should be paying attention. What should I care about? What's the most urgent thing? And we think it can only be one. So, zoom out 30,000 feet. What is active in you? The work of activism is at the heart of it being fully alive. Let's go back to that man on the plane. If it is truly the ability to think for oneself, right? Because I, I like to think of the muscle, uh, the mind rather, as the muscle of the soul. And if not thinking and not being present is the death of it, which is complacency, then the ability to think for oneself and to see the world as it is, not we, as we were told, and to see each other as we are, not as we were told we are, well, that, that's one of the holiest things that one can do, and the opposite, the most heinous. So the work of activism is at the heart of it being fully alive, and when you become fully alive, charged, present, there is no issue that is too great. Your call to action, it's not yet too late to be the person you always thought that you could be. And you thought that you could be someone remarkable, and you're right. You don't have to be remarkable to do this work, and I used to think that you did. Oh, I used to think that you did. And then I learned something in all my years. Nobody starts out as remarkable. We become remarkable when we fight for freedom, when we fight for justice, when we fight for liberation. You, too, become remarkable. Here's another call to action. Because everybody stands in the age where everybody stands for something. And we all stand for something now. We're all saying everything all the time. It's not just about what you stand for. It's about who you sit with. Because there are parts in us, of us, that can only be accessed by others. So your work is to live remarkable and extraordinary lives, and you do that by seeking out truth. We don't get overwhelmed by issues. We give them attention, we give them life. Find out who you are. Live an extraordinary and remarkable life. And dare to imagine a world that is vastly different from the one that we live in. Because remember, someone imagined shackles on black wrists, and enough people believed it to make it true. Somebody imagined borders, and enough people believed it to make it true. Our job is to be the disruptors, the diviners of change. Our job is to imagine differently and make it true. Thank you.